I still don't see why it's necessary to go through all that expense just to change the colour of your hair. Can't you just dye it? No, we can't just dye it. That'd be ridiculous. The genetic alteration of our hair is a part of culture and tradition. And I agree with you. The procedure is ridiculously expensive for such a small thing. But it's symbolic for nobility and royalty to afford that expense. It's something that shows that the parents accept their child. Like, blessing them. Any child who doesn't have the procedure is essentially disowned and bastardized. The unnatural blue and green hair colour is the distinction between nobles and the people. Like how my white hair distinguishes me as royalty. Without this colour, we would be cast out as nobodies. Someone thought not worthy to be in a noble or royal family. If only there was a product that changed the colour of your hair. Oh wait, there is. Dye is fake. Something that covers up the true colour underneath. Since the colour of hair is symbolic of aristocratic lineage, it would dishonour the image of nobility and royalty to wear fake colours. It's not something I expect you to understand, really. And honestly, I do find it rather... unique. But it has its reason for being such a long-standing tradition. Mainly so dukes can keep their family tree trim by simply denying their newborn children the procedure if they've already got one too many heirs. That's why our hair colour isn't made hereditary anyway. So they can choose. It even used to be illegal for citizens to dye their hair the same colours for slandering us. Well, it still is technically, but no one really cares to enforce it now. Who in the hell would care about that? Oh, quite a few people. Not as fervently as I'm told they used to, and not as many people as once did, but there are still people out there who still keep with our traditions. Being the descendants of families who freed the planet from corporate-run Swedish tyranny has us rather highly approved of. Oh please, I'm drowning in hypocrisy. Your families used to be the very corporations that exploited the people you rule over today. Used to be. Not anymore. We did no worse than what any other business did. Bribes, unpaid overtime, market monopolies, tax cuts. All things we still see today across the expanse. You can't compete against that without stooping to the same level. And today here we are. Things have turned out rather well, haven't they? And things are just wonderful for your people now, isn't it? Better than it was. And everyone knows it. All they have to do is compare us to the outsiders. Now, Lewis, can we move on from politics? I have to talk about that enough already without me having to include secret agents. You're here for other reasons, and if you plan on sticking around, like you said, I don't want to have this conversation every time I meet you. Isn't it high time I got a straight explanation about this psionic business? Yes, I suppose it is. I was going to send a file with all the information, but that would have required more work than was really needed considering the encryption and security needed for such a small amount of information. So yes, psionics. A wonderful and mysterious phenomenon of people. And when you say straight explanation, I assure you that this is nothing of the sort. Where to begin, eh? A psionic is an individual who was born with a unique mutation to their DNA which enables the inheritor to use their mind to harness control and direct paranormal energy, psionic energy, within them. This mutation occurs deep within the nucleotides that connect DNA helix strands. This mutation is impossible to find without standard tools and without the knowledge of where and when to look. Now, while only psionics have this mutation, all humans are carriers of a genetic primer that can, but will most likely not, cause their own offsprings to have this mutation. So, two people whose ancestral lineage never once contained a psionic may still produce one in their children. This genetic primer was put into the human genome after exposure to the sun without Earth's ozone protection, and then passed on to every other human over time. How the light of the sun did this, and why Mother Earth's ozone stopped this from occurring before, is still unknown. While there are uncountable theories to explain it, that would require we to send down an entire other rabbit hole, so I won't stray. Origins surmised, we now move on to what we know about psionic energy. While non-psionics like you have a very minuscule amount of this psionic energy within them, it is psionics, and only psionics, who were born with a more potent and plentiful amount of this energy, and only they have the ability to nurture this energy to greater heights. This energy manifests into powers and abilities that go beyond the understanding of science and technology. Hence why we sometimes refer to psionic power as paranormal or supernatural power. 
Now, the range of psionic power is not affected at all by sex or race, only by time, as I will explain. To visualise and understand the range of power psionics can possess, the Inspectorate created the Psi Scale. It is not an exact scale, as there is no instrument that can measure psionic power. We've tried, but so far the only way we've been able to judge the power of a psionic is to feel that power ourselves. Wait, if psionics have been around for more than two millennia, then how has this not been revealed to the public yet? Do national leaders know about this? Scourge, no. Prime Ministers and Chancellors hardly keep their offices more than three or four years. If we told every single one, then one of them would leak the information eventually. So no, absolutely not. You, Isaac, are a rare exception. Now, the Psi Scale. The Psi Scale separates psionics of varying psionic power into tiers by order of magnitude logarithmically. In practice, the tiers range from 1 to 12, though it is theoretically possible to keep going up the scale if it were not for time restrictions and the fact that no one has surpassed the 12th tier without lethal consequences. Which again, I will get to. The order of magnitude sees an increase in psionic power to the scale of 7. A tier 2 psionic is 7 times as potent as a tier 1, which means a tier 3 psionic is 49 times as powerful as a tier 1. Yes, Inspector. I was tutored in maths. Did any of your tutors teach you manners? Shush! So where was I? Ah. Normal humans are born, live and die in the null tier 0. Even if they were able to control their powers, said powers would be so unsubstantial and weak they would never even know they had them. Now, psionics usually are born within tier 1 of the scale. Some are born stronger, but that is entirely random, and it makes no practical difference. That is because within tiers 1 to 3, a psionic's power is so weak it is practically inert, which is good because as babies a psionic has no discipline, and throws their psionic powers around like a doll. However, this is where it can get tricky. Psionic power is cultivated and enhanced by being used. Psionic power increases faster as a child such as Rosalie experiences cognitive growth. Unfettered use of psionic power alongside cognitive growth leads to an exponential surge in power. Further cognitive growth comes with age, which is why older psionics are almost always the most powerful. Oh, and most psionic abilities come to them naturally over time, though they can be learnt early if taught by others. Am I going too fast here? There's a lot to take in, and I'm not usually the person to go to when explaining this. Keep going. Okay. The highest, stable, tier a psionic ever reached was tier 12. According to many seasoned psionics, it is theoretically possible to reach stable tiers well into the hundreds given enough time. The crux being time, which as humans we do not have much of. It takes decades to reach tiers as high as 10 safely, and if there is a tier beyond 12 that can be stably reached, then we have yet to see it achieved. This is because when we say we control our paranormal powers, it is technically more accurate to say we can contain and direct it at our will, so long as we're stable. You lost me at the mention of stable. Psionics can become unstable then, I assume? And how does psionics even go up this scale? Ah, yes of course. It's actually very simple. So simple it's dangerous. As I said, a psionic enhances their power simply by using it. Take telepathy, for example. By using it, we not only enhance our power, but that exact ability becomes easier to do, making the use of that power less difficult in of itself, and thus making it easier to use even more often. And stability is a catch-all word for how well a psionic contains their power. As psionic's powers become more potent, so does the stress of containing it. If you will imagine our mind like a dam, and the water behind it our power, then as we enhance our power, this imaginary water behind our imaginary dam is exponentially increasing in volume. Our ability to rapidly enhance and grow our power massively outstrips our growing capacity to contain it. Again, now think of a dam being slammed by larger and larger pools of water with no time in between the waves to fix the cracks or make it higher. So we either have to limit the use of our power and wait for the dam to get stronger with time, note I said time, not specifically age, or use something to temporarily raise the dam, like Zro. If our psionic power grows more potent than the theoretical dam's ability to contain it, then we become unstable. 
Once Psionic's power is stronger than their power to contain it, that power lashes out and damages the brain. Imagine our theoretical dam is overflowing and leaking at this point. Now at this point the situation is still fixable, but often things get messy. See, a psionic is stimulated by the damage their power inflicts on their brain. They become addicted and usually engage in as much psionic activity as possible, until the dam bursts open and kills the brain. Please repeat to me your understanding of everything so far. Psionics are magic, and talking makes you tired. <sighs> Besides that... Psionics have a DNA mutation that gives them the ability to use magic powers, and they're born with a large amount of psionic power in them. Psionics get more powerful by using their powers, but they have to limit how much they use those powers, otherwise they become unstable, and a metaphorical dam bursts open in their brain. The only way to get better at containing increasingly potent psionic power is by getting older. Actually, not age. Time. Older psionics can control much more power, yes, but only because with time we also happen to age. If we didn't age, we would still be building up that metaphorical dam. But yes, that's about the gist of it. However, there is a way to temporarily give a boost to our ability to contain this power. It's illegal, lethal to non-psionics, and really tastes, or smells if it's in a gaseous form, quite good. Over the course of our lives, it is very likely at some point we will overstep ourselves, and become too potent for our own good. So, it is very handy that we have a few ways of strengthening our ability to contain our power. This, dear prince, is where the only council outlawed drug, Zro, comes into the equation. While lethal to non-psionics in even minuscule amounts, it is to a psionic everything they need it to be. It can enhance their power well beyond their comfort zone without needing increased strength to contain it. It can help them contain their power during bouts of instability. It can even help with learning further powers, or be used to revitalize the mind. Often it can do all these things at once. It is a psionic super drug, and it is extremely valuable. You know we have an asteroid in the Hatela system loaded with that stuff. The Council is always checking up on that, making sure we aren't mining it. The Council usually has Nation extract Zro on their behalf, under the excuse that they're taking it to be destroyed. Unofficially, they simply pay off the authorities and national leaders to deliver it to them, where it is then handed out to us. But the Kingdom of Belateria isn't known for its willingness to participate with the Council unless forced. But you'll find the Council doesn't mind you mining it anymore. So long as most of this row is collected by us. You will of course still need to keep it secret from your own authorities, unless you can ruffle up some excuse or other. Doing it secretly isn't really possible for me right now. I've already got my father peering down my back for running things behind his. And they know there's a psionic in my family? No, most of the councilmen don't even know we exist. It's all very hush-hush, and relations between the Inspectorate and Council are somewhat rocky right now. Long story short of it is that the Council fears us, and bars us from as much power and life-prolonging treatment as they can, which doesn't fly so well with us anymore. But, all you need to know is that the Inspectorate has simply informed those who are concerned that the monarchy of Velutaria has been convinced to extract Zro on our behalf. Now how about we wrap this up? I can sense your sister's anticipation already. She must know I'm here. I won't even ask how she knows. You said she was a mute psionic? Yes, there are three types of psionics, all with ridiculous names. Radiance, light bulbs, who are also called switches, and then mutes. The difference is partly described in the name. Switches are psionics whose power is not revealed until they use their power. When not using it, they look normal like I do now. Which is why we call these kinds of psionics light bulbs or switches. You only see the light in their eyes when it's switched on. Radiants are psionics whose light is always on, whether they're using psionic power or not. Problematic as it makes it hard to hide from the doctors delivering them. Oh, I've read this. Newborn babies with glowing eyes. Doctors are taught that a child with bright eyes has a space-born genetic disease, and that unless the baby is killed, then it'll suffer some horrible death. Can't have psionics who can't hide their powers running around. People are stupid, but if we turned up every time a glowing-eyed baby was born, people might start connecting dots. 
In the cases where a doctor didn't have the guts to end the poor things, we've had to arrange the demise of a child to keep up the belief that they will die anyway. A business I have had the pleasure of avoiding so far. Moving on, the last kind of psionic is a newt. They are invisible psionics whose power cannot be observed or sensed by other psionics unless they themselves are the target of that mute's power. And that's Rosalie, I take it. Wait, if she's mute, how can you sense her? Her undisciplined mind reaches out to others like tendrils, poking and prodding at everything she can sense. Like I said, a psionic can sense a mute if that mute reaches out to them. Speaking of your sister... Mr. Lewis, are you in there? And that's my cue. Here, Isaac, take this form and hand it to your father. It contains some bogus reason for why I'm staying here. So I don't have to sneak around here every day hoping I don't run into him. I am now an ambassador for Council Veletarian Relations, who has by council order been granted the right to move around this premises. Now unless there is anything else, I will be off. One more thing. My mother. Why? Why did she die? In the womb, a psionic child has some potently strong link with their mother's mind. The mother isn't aware of it, but the child begins learning at a much younger age because of it. You've noticed your sister is already an apt speaker, yes? Well, that's because she was learning words long before she even had the ability to coo and car. Psionics tend to be smarter than average because of it, and have natural affinities for whatever their mothers also had. Maths, science, art. But it seems when the baby is born, the link is severed. Why the link is cut, we're unsure, but we know that the moment the link is cut, the mother's brain ceases to function soon after. 